Can Thank you, hear you me? so much. Uh, yeah, yeah, I can hear you. Can yeah, you hear me? Yes, yes, yes. Loud and clear, ma'am. Loud and clear. Thank you so much. First of all, thank you so much for accepting our invitation. You are a very busy person, but still uh, you are able to give us some time. I mean, we are, we are really fortunate, you know. And pleasure is mine, Dr. Anirudh. And I lo just love interacting with young people. And I'm hoping that this discussion, this just do does not remain like a lecture, but it turns out to be an interactive exercise between me and all the people who are uh, very graciously attending this event. Indeed, indeed. Thank you so much for your positive words. We'll start in one minute. Sure. Uh, do you mind if I keep my camera switched off because camera eats into your bandwidth? Yeah, it doesn't matter. Please, I don't mind because we all have this problem. Please go ahead. Yeah, sure. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, no problem. Good afternoon, all of you. This is uh, your host once again, greeting you uh, to this uh, yet another uh, exciting and uh, wonderful session of Dot Talks webinar series. My name is Dr. Aniruddha Babar, and today we have a wonderful guest with us who has graciously accepted our invitation, and uh, she is. Advocate Anish Katyagi. Let me just uh, give a brief introduction about her. Advocate Tyagi is currently heading business strategies department of Legal Namicus, a young dynamic law firm having offices at New Delhi and UAE. Ma'am has executed and advised both foreign and domestic companies on transactions related to private equity, investments, real estate acquisitions corporate restructuring arrangements, commercial contracts, and secretarial matters. Besides, Ma'am has been a regular contributor to law magazines and journals, a regular speaker at conferences and seminars, and has addressed a wide variety of audience at various platforms on corporate legal issues. Being a sports enthusiast, Ma'am has special interest in sports law and has worked with a number of sports persons, federations, and leagues in sports related legal issues. Maybe that is the reason that uh, Advocate Tyagi has taken up this uh, wonderful topic, very sensitive topic, very complex on ground. And the topic is gender issues in sports. Advocate Kanishka Tyagi, now stage is yours. Please go ahead. We are waiting to hear from you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And thank you for all the kind words uh, that you just uttered about me. And I'm glad for this opportunity by Tetsu College and especially by Dr. Nirudh Babar. Uh, I'm hoping that today, whatever we discuss, whatever little knowledge that I have that I'll be sharing with all of you will be of some use. And after this uh, discussion, this session, all of you will feel a little more enlightened after this one hour session. Okay, so the topic for me is gender issue in sports. And as Dr. Baba mentioned, uh, I have a special interest in sports, not just uh, as a spectator. I've also been involved in sports as a sports lawyer with certain sports persons, certain sports federations, a few leagues. And also, I've been presenting sports shows on all india radio since my college days though now i do not get to do that very often because i am busy with my legal law career and uh, it holds a special place in my heart so that's why i thought that today this uh, discussion will be very important this topic will be a good topic to share my knowledge on this subject with all of you so let, allow me to share my screen with you so that I can just uh, use the 
a small PPT that I have prepared for this particular subject. Just one second and here we go. Um, actually, I'm slightly new to Google Meet. Would I not be able to share my PPT here? Uh, we are not able to see anything. Uh... No, I'm just asking, would I be able to share a PPT which is already opened on my screen, but I don't see it when... Does it only allow to share Google pages? No, no, even PPT can also be shared. Allow me just one more time. Let me try one more time. Please, please take, please take your time. No problem. I cannot. So, do you do you see anything on screen now? Yeah, it's coming. It's coming. So, what do you see now? Mm, yeah. Uh, all right. Do you uh, see differences the of sex development. Yes, yeah, yeah. it's coming. Yeah. It has come. Uh, yeah. Okay, let me start. Please, please. Yeah, so sure. this is the topic, gender issues in sports. So first, to understand or to talk about this topic, obviously we need to see what is gender, in what sense gender is understood when it comes to sports. However, if we talk about layman language or day-to-day -day language, whenever we use word gender, usually we intend to specify sexes, male or female. But actually, sex or and gender and cannot be used interchangeably gender is something which has more to do with the kind of roles either you see yourself playing as belonging to a particular category of gender or certain attributes about your personality certain expected behaviors that are expected from you from a particular kind of gender for instance i'm just here highlighting the stereotype that we have in our society. Whenever we talk about female gender, we expect the female gender to behave in a certain, within quotes, feminine way, to be polite, to be very, you know, good with everyone, to not use abusive language, to be good at certain tasks like cooking, keeping, you know, doing household chores. However, when we talk about masculine gender, then we expect certain kind of behavior. We expect the man to protect the women. We expect the man to be a good driver. And there are certain kind of roles we, which we expect from a man. So these are the stereotypes with which most of the people in our societies across countries, across continents, the, the people grow up with these beliefs. People grow up with these stereotypes that certain kind. There are only two genders or two sexes. Here I'm using it interchangeably. These two sexes exist, male and female, and we put them in very strict compartments. That a male person has to behave strictly in within the confines of the definition of male person that as we see it and the woman is expected to uh, behave and you know talk and do everything in a feminine way so called feminine way however in reality though we do not acknowledge it or we fear acknowledging it i do not know what is what exactly is the problem in reality people at times do not strictly belong to either male category or female category a lot of people whenever they talk about their own gender they feel very fluid at times if you would read or research on this topic you would see and i'm sure 
you may know one or two people like that who may feel like behaving in a masculine way on one particular day and behaving in a feminine way on another day and gender is sometimes a very fluid thing also for an individual however as a society we expect gender and we see gender as a very strict black and white compartment in which you can put your male and female people now when we talk about gender issues obviously if we say if we are using these two words together gender and issues it certainly means that all those issues all those all those concerning areas which have something to do with the gender so in short if you see these three words on your screen inaccessible discrimination and traditional expectations which means any issue either there are certain resources certain kind of equipment certain kind of benefits which are inaccessible to you because you belong to a certain gender then it shall be deemed to be a gender issue or if you are discriminated against by an authority by a group of individuals by a professional team by anybody by just an individual also that individual may be your teacher may be your friend may be your neighbor if you are discriminated just on the basis of your gender or your sex then that issue certainly is gender issue then traditional expectations in professional uh, milieu or in personal life also people expect you to behave in a certain way for instance whenever we talk about marriage we we see and we expect the women to cook great tasting food so this is an expectation which we expect from all people who identify as women whether that may or may not be true in reality that's an altogether different question however if we expect you to be of certain kind of certain physical characters of certain behavior to if you we expect a certain kind of behavior from you then that is certainly a gender issues there could be more kind of gender issues but at a broad level these are the three areas in which in which gender issues may fall now let's just discuss few broad gender issues which exist in sports when we talk about sports in general well we know that in even in our day to day lives also this is the most common gender issue that exists in every in most of the offices i wouldn't say every office in most of the professions in everywhere in life there exists something called gender pay gap which is nothing which is just in equality when it comes to payment of remuneration payment of salary payment of consultation fee payment of any amount of money to a particular gender and that amount of money which is received by a particular gender as remuneration fee or salary is considerably less than the other gender for doing the same kind of work for putting in the same amount of hard work and no surprises no points for guessing that this inequality in pay exists with reference to female gender lot of women in lot of industries are paid much less than their male counterparts for doing the same kind of work for being the same kind of educated for putting in same number of hours of work for doing everything same as their male counterpart but despite that they get paid a lesser amount at times there is a stark difference between the remuneration that is paid to a man and that is paid to a woman for in same industry for same designation for same kind of work just see this beautiful quote by legendary tennis player billy jean king who was an advocate of women and gay rights everyone thinks women should be thrilled when we get crowns and i want women to have the cake the icing and the cherry on top too i love this quote because i would like our society to be like that that women can also just like just women can also a day there should be a day when women can be gender neutral when they are seen as just persons as just 
individuals performing their tasks and not as women and when they are seen as just individuals performing their tasks doing their duties then i feel that there will be a day when then they can have their cake cake icing and the cherry on top too why billy jean king uh, said these words is also in reference to the inequality in payment that existed at that time in tennis world women were paid much lesser amount than their male counterparts male tennis players so she started this uh, whole fight and we all know about this famous match called battle of sexes however i'll not go into the detail of battle of sexes so moving forward let me just explain to you and try to bring home this point that how stark difference there exists how stark gap exists there between the salaries or remuneration in indian cricket we all know indian cricket is a huge industry it's a multi million dollar industry we we were the first country to start a league in cricket we all know indian premier league despite this covid era ipl is such a big phenomenon that we could not postpone it to next year or maybe after that year something as big as olympics has been postponed but ipl could not have been postponed because there are num huge amount of money that is involved obviously not as much as olympics but having said so ipl is a biggest thing that is that exists today in the world of cricket and we know that lot of players in india and abroad also they get paid by their league owners in crores they are paid in the huge amount of money despite the fact some of them are picked from grassroots level some of them are picked from domestic circuit in india so let's just take a look at the salaries of our stars of indian cricket so there are there you see few columns which say a plus a b and c these are four grades actually which bcci board of cricket control in india of india which regulates entire cricketing uh, world in india that has come up with these four categories so players are bracketed in these four categories a plus a b and c and depending on their level of expertise depending on their experience depending on the their performance and once you are put in one particular bracket your salary also annual salary also depends on that bracket so the first bracket as we can see on our screen is a plus or a positive positive is a wrong word these days so i'll just say a plus so virat kohli star player virat kohli rohit sharma ace bowler jasprit bumrah these are few players which are in a plus category and they receive something as high as 7 crores a year for playing for india then you have other brackets 5 crores 3 crores and 1 crore here i just would like you all of you to pay attention to grade c people falling in grade c also get something as high as 1 crore rupees per year and who are the players who are put in that bracket washington sundar shardul thakur navdeep saini all new all promising uh, kids they are aspiring players they are not established players they've shown that they have potential and that is why they've been uh, you know incentivized by being paid 1 crore rupee so that they can hone their talent they can they get more opportunities to show to world and to india that they deserve this money and they can tomorrow become something like someone like virat kohli or rohit sharma and tomorrow they can proceed to a plus grade not just in terms of money that they receive but also in terms of the performances that they show so these are new three names that have picked who are really new to world of cricket as far as international cricket is concerned and they've shown that they have potential but they've not played a lot of cricket. now let's just have a look at indian female cricketers how are they paid so for female cricketers also there are three brackets a b and c but the premium most bracket that is grade a that is paid something as less as 
50 lakhs of rupees. Our star cricketers, I'm sure, even if you have zero interest in cricket, even if you have zero minus interest in female cricket, then you would have heard these names. Harman Preet Kaur, Smriti Mandana and Poonam Yadav. These are star players. Harman Preet Kaur is captain of T20 uh, team of India. Harman Preet Kaur is an Arjuna awardee. Smriti Mandana was in news a few years, a couple of years back, although for all the wrong reasons, she was in news because of her cute smile. But she, the girl has shown that she has great potential. If you look at bracket C here, the girls who get paid 10 lakhs a year, there you see name of a very talented girl called Shafali Verma. You must have heard about her story. You must have heard or seen or read her story. Shafali Verma is a girl who comes from a small village and her father was very supportive. He's, he's still very supportive. But in her early days, she would spot really short hair and she would pose as a boy to enable herself to play cricket. That is the state of affairs in our country. And this promising girl, she just sees the ball and hits it out of the park. You have to see her perform to understand what I'm trying to say. This girl, this promising girl gets paid 10 lakh rupees, which so many people get as their first salaries. Their first salary packages are that high sometimes. Though I'm not taking away anything from, from a person who's getting that kind of money, but just want to show that Shefali Verma, who's had a difficult life, who always acted or pretended to be a boy to be able to play the game that she loves, the girl who has shown promise, we are in, you know, giving her an incentive in form of just 10 lakh rupees annually. So, and we expect her to give performances so that we can on one day confer Arjuna award on her. So just let me just, you know, uh, compare two players now and just try to allow me to highlight this difference between pay and performance and this difference between female pay and male pay. So this this star player, Harman Preet Kaur, and this is a few statistics about her. She's played 99 One Day Internationals, 114 T20 Internationals. She's scored 200, more than 2,000 runs in ODIs. Her highest score is 171. Sometimes the entire team in One Day International get out at that score, 171. 103 is her highest score in T20 match. And she's the first Indian women, woman to play in Big Bash League. Big Bash League is a league which is being organized by Australia, Australian Cricket Board. And it is a league similar to IPL, but no points for guessing. It's a league only for women players, for women teams. Here you have a, another promising talent called Washington Sundar. He's played one ODI and he's uh, played 23 T20 international. He's taken 19 wickets and one ODI wicket. So this guy has shown promise, but he's very new. And let me now go back to this table here. So Washington Sundar gets one crore a year, and Harman Preet Kaur, the star, gets 50 lakhs a year. So Harman Preet Kaur is almost like a veteran player now. She's now a mentor to the younger lot in her team. For someone like Veda Krishnamurti, for someone like uh, Shafali Verma that we were talking about, she she mentors them as their captain and as a senior player in dressing room. Washington Sundar is a baby in cricket. He looks up to, I'm sure he looks up to someone like Harman Preet Kaur. He gets paid. Allow, please do that math. How many times, what is the difference between 50 lakhs and 1 crores? It's almost, it's double, exactly double, right? So here I just wanted to highlight that how uh, deep-rooted this problem is, that we are not willing to pay high, a decent amount to a star cricket women players. Just see a few things here. That women cricketer, let's just forget about cricket. 
women sports person they have same kind of skill that is required to play that game the rules of the game that they play whether it is cricket football rowing ice hockey tennis the rules of that game remain same both players men and women get injured while playing and sometimes that injury is it, it's like it like remains throughout their lives women games are not even marketed properly in most of the sports when it comes to cricket bcci sometimes even does not tweet about women games in fact there have been international women games in which indian cricket team was involved and there are no score cards available for those games and also women have very fewer of opportunity when it comes to playing uh, you would be interested uh, you would be thrilled to know that indian uh, someone like harman preet kaur someone like mithali raj they can count their test matches on their fingers because in cricket women are not given opportunity to play test cricket and while test cricket is really common when it comes to men cricket however there are some opposing arguments also in fact smriti mandana the star player of indian cricket team she was also uh, expressing her views on this gender pay gap while she was uh, while she was in a press conference and she said that we do not earn revenue women cricket does not earn as much revenue as men cricket revenue comes from men cricket so actually they should be paid more but that's in my understanding uh, understanding is a faulty logic because you are putting in same amount of hard work and you are games your opportunities are much less if we would have marketed you the way we market our men you would probably have been bringing in numbers also you would probably have brought that kind of revenue so a lot of people who oppose this uh, this theory that women and men should be paid equally they say that women cricket does not earn that much revenue they also say that not many spectators are there in the stadiums and not just stadiums uh, generally the followers of cricket when it comes to women cricket are not that many it is not on anybody's agenda and also india does not have women t20 league so whose fault it is that india does not have beat women t20 league for that matter in consider any game if you take example of kabaddi for kabaddi we have seen that pro kabaddi league is a huge uh, league today in india though not as though not as big as ipl but there has been only one edition of women pro kabaddi league so we have to give equal opportunities to both the genders to show to allow them to showcase their talent to prove that they can also earn money for their federations and to show that they deserve equal pay however they they've already shown that they deserve equal pay in my understanding let's just see example of us women football here us women football's entire team entire team filed a lawsuit and they alleged that they were being discriminated because of their gender and they were not being paid as much pay as as much match reward as their male athletes male counterparts in fact us women football team is a very successful team it is much more successful than their us men's team and they play more games they, they the spectators are also sometimes more in some star matches some really uh, celebrated matches however this suit was dismissed and they were it was not allowed so tennis also has seen a similar story time and again i just uh, briefly told you about billy jean king and battle of sexes but after that also venus williams wrote an article in one of the newspapers and the article said the title of the article was wimbledon has sent me a message i am only a second class champion and she wrote this in 2006 and it's a very good news that in 2007 wimbledon agreed to pay equal amount of prize money to men and women and if we talk about other uh, other events other major tennis grand prix events like us open french open they are also 
paying almost equal amount of money, prize money to men and women, which is a good news. Now, let me just move to another very serious gender issue which exists in world of sports. Uh, that is to make you understand that issue. Let's just see this quote by athlete Duti Chand. She says, I was born a woman, reared up as a woman, I identify as a woman, and I believe I should be allowed to participate with other women. I'm sure by reading this and by hearing me repeating these words by Duti Chand, you would have understood. The issue is that some women are barred from playing across continents, across sports, and the allegation against them and the ground that is cited for not allowing them to play in women events is that they are not women enough. I'm not sure how did, on what basis, Federations, Olympic Committee, Olympic Association arrived at that definition of being a woman, but they are told by some people some people in power that you are not woman enough and you have a competitive advantage over others because you are of certain physical attributes, because you have certain hormones in your body which do not allow us to identify you or to categorize you as a woman. So Yuti Chan faced this problem, however, in the end she, she, was, she won that case and she was successful and that is why we see her bringing medals and accolades for India. So let's just understand Jyoti Jan's curious case. So there is this term called hyperandrogenism. Heavy word. Very, very heavy word. In short, I will tell you what it means. But let me just give you background that Jyoti Jan is an athlete and she was alleged, she was allegedly barred by not just Indian Athletics Federation, but also World Athletics from participating in athletic events and on the ground that she's not woman enough. Let's just see. Whatever I'm speaking, those points are also on the, on the screen so that you do not miss anything. So <clears throat> Athletics Federation of India, they, they got Duty Chand tested for testosterone levels under pretext of doping tests. And this is very interesting here. They did not even tell her that we are doing something called sex verification test on you. She was told that we will do a doping test and then they made some kind of, uh, they gave some kind of excuse and they said, we cannot take your blood, so we we'll have to do an ultrasound. And uh, it is nothing but a doping test, which is very normal for any sort of player because under NADA and WADA rules, you are supposed to appear for all the doping tests that you are asked to appear for. Then these tests were conducted because her performance in national championships were, was much better than other women athletes. And because she was performing better, certain players, certain people, not just players, but also people in the federation, they raise questions that she looks in a certain way, she looks very masculine, and she performs better than other women, so better check her if she's woman enough or not. So that is why these tests were conducted on her. The tests, as per the requirement, as per the norms that exist in the uh, Indian Athletic Federation and also World Athletics, the tests are not allowed to be made public. However, this was somehow leaked and a lot of news articles appeared in newspapers. So those, those newspaper articles were really speculative and after reading those articles, everybody could understand that which is the athlete who's being talked about in these articles. And that athlete has been questioned and has been barred from playing because that athlete is not woman, is not identified as woman by the definition that is that World Athletics has adopted. Then she was after the, those tests provisionally suspended. And the, the thing that led to her suspension was high testosterone level. Testosterone is a hormone which is usually found in higher 
level, higher quantities, if I can use that word quantity, that is found in higher quantities in men generally. And when it is high in women, they look a certain way. They look a little manly, a little masculine. Right? So that is why it was found that her testosterone levels were high. But those are naturally high. She has not inserted anything in her body. She's not taken any injection, not taken any pill, done nothing at all to make sure that testosterone levels are high. Those are naturally high. It's a natural condition for her. Duty obviously challenged this decision with Court of Arbitration for Sports at Switzerland. Court of Arbitration for Sport is, you can understand it as the uh, Supreme Court of Sport. However, this court is a global Supreme Court when it comes to sports. So almost all the international sporting federations and also International Olympic Association, they have accepted the jurisdiction of Court of Arbitration for Sports for all disputes between sports persons and federations and between federations and federations and between federations on one hand and International Olympic Association on the other. So primarily all kind of sports disputes after they are decided between internally within the federation, within the particular sports federation, they are then taken to court of arbitration for sport. Either the player who is involved in the dispute or the federation who is involved in the dispute, either of these two people or the International Olympic Association. Any of these parties may approach court of arbitration for sport and ask them to arbitrate that particular dispute. This code of arbitration for sport is in Lausanne, Switzerland. So, <clears throat> uh, we, we know that there are two categories in which athletes are allowed to participate, female and male. And these two categories exist because there is a different be difference between the physical attributes of these two sexes. Males obviously are stronger and they are stronger, it is said, because they have endogenous testosterone. Endogenous testosterone means naturally the testosterone in body of a male person exists naturally. And hyperandrogenism bars females from participating in female competition. And there is a level you see on your screen in second point, 10 nanomole per liter. So if you have hyper testosterone in your body if you are a female which is if and you have testosterone in your body more than 10 nanomole per liter then you shall not be allowed to participate in female competitions as an athlete and it is the athlete who has to prove that i have not taken anything externally either a pill or an injection to increase this testosterone level in my body and it does not confer any competitive advantage to me over others. Now, we see certain points on the basis of which Duty challenged this decision by World Athletics and Indian Athletics Federation. That it is clearly discrimination if you do not allow a person to participate because of high naturally existing testosterone in the body, then you should not allow probably a person who has bigger hands in cricket or maybe who is very tall, taller than the normal human beings in NBA, in basketball, or maybe a bulkier person normal than normal persons in short coat, or maybe a person who has, uh, you know, lighter body or maybe flatter hands, bigger hands in swimming. So these are, these are, this is natural physical character and natural gender. So if you are, if you have different set of rules for a particular thing which exists naturally, then it is obviously discrimination. It does not lend any advantage. That was her argument. That was Diti's argument. And another thing that, uh, another point that she read was that there is no study, no scientific backing to back this fact or to back this argument that if you have higher level of testosterone in your body, it will give you performance advantage over other people. Then also the proportionality of this thing was questioned that 
even if you see that there is a harm in allowing this kind of women to participate with women who have low testosterone then the harm that you are doing the punishment that you are inflicting upon these females is much higher it is not proportionate to the benefit that these people may get or the regulation that uh, bars these kind of women though the benefit of that regulation are highly disproportionate uh, proportionate to the harm that is that this regulation is inflicting upon the athletes so these were the grounds another thing which you have to be very sensitive generally when you discuss hyperandrogenism and duty chan are these points that you see on your sheet just let me just give you an example just think of a woman who lives in a very small village maybe 100 families 200 families live in that village or less and everybody knows everybody and everybody knows this person uh, because she has won certain medals at international level at national level and everybody is proud of her not just her parents but the entire village is proud of her entire state is also proud of her that our girl girl from our village has done something great at international level we are proud of her and this news breaks out that this person whom you were hailing all along as a woman is not a woman is a man just imagine what that kind of thing what that kind of sensational news will do to the dignity of that person that person will be in a constant identity crisis it is it leads to stigmatization of female athletes you you everybody will start to question the moment you look a little masculine the moment you behave a little in a certain tomboyish way people will start questioning you so it will only give encouragement to a very strict compartmentalized feminine behavior that don't look too masculine don't behave like a tomboy just be very feminine and just fit into the expectation of society society wishes to see you in a certain way just fit into that expectation that category if you don't fit in there it will lead to it will challenge you it will challenge you it will just erode your confidence it will erode your identity entire idea of your your idea of about yourself it will erode that so certainly it damages the self esteem it also raises question in the minds of that particular athlete about his or her own gender identity who am i right and also you are expected to bring those testosterone levels down and then only you will be allowed to perform these procedures have side effects you would not want for your 10 year or 15 year athletics career okay i am allowed to play for this 10 15 years but my remaining life will be i will have to have certain kind of complications certain type kind of physical or mental complication during entire life because of these mental medical procedures so these things were also some points were raised about the teacher and then in fact a lot of it raised a lot of uh, uh, discussions and campaigns also against these regulations and in the end code of arbitration of uh, sport arbitration for sports suspended the regulations which barred females having high testosterone from participating for a period of 2 years and they asked the world athletics body to come back with further evidence with further studies scientific studies in support of their contention that high testosterone leads to competitive advantage however after 2 years uh, that 2 year period expired in 2017 the world athletics did approach cas again but that matter was settled and it did not proceed further and these regulations were suspended also why these regulations were suspended because Uh, world athletics told cas that we are just uh, doing away with this particular uh, regulation but we'll come up with an amended regulation for this particular uh, problem only and we'll also come up with further scientific study so they changed the rule and this rule was changed in april 2018 and uh, this rule also targeted certain kind of women. so here before i move to another case similar case 
of another athlete, a celebrated athlete, Castor Semenya. Just read this quote by Castor Semenya. For a decade, IAF, which is now known as World Athletics, has tried to slow me down. But this has actually made me stronger. The decision of Cass will not hold me back. So this were her words when she lost the battle before court of arbitration for sports in a similar case like Duty Chan. So let's just see what were the issue that Castor Simonia faced. So her problem relates to something called differences of sex development. So what is differences of sex development? Uh, basic, I I'll come to that, but first, the regulations. World Athletics, as promised to CAS, they issued new regulations in place of hyperandrogenism regulations. These regulations were, are called differences of sex development. And these were implemented actually in 2018, but due to this court, uh, this court of arbitration case between CAS Tessimania and World Athletics, it got postponed and finally got implemented in 2019. So these regulations, DSD regulation, they govern eligibility of women with differences of sex development and testosterone of more than five nanomole per liter to participate in certain athletic events. And those events are 400 meter, 800 meter and 1500 meter. Now here you must note that Castor Seminia phase sex verification test prior, much before Duty Chunk case. And then she was allowed to participate, to continue her participation in athletic events because, and then Duty Chan filed a case in court of arbitration. So she was, Castor Semenya meanwhile was participating. When Cass, uh, when World Athletics could not win the case against Duty Chan, they came up with this DSD regulation. And this DSD regulation was devised by World Athletics, especially keeping in mind Castor Semenya, because Castor Semenya runs 400, 800, and 1500 meter events. So it is. it was said that these regulations directly target Castor Semenya. She is a celebrated athlete. She, she performs much better than other her competition. So people with differences of sex development do not fall in the traditional categories of gender so either the hormones or the genes or the genitalia that is slightly different from male and female sometimes it is a mix of both male and female characteristics and such people are also known as intersex people who have certain qualities certain attributes genes or reproductive organs or hormones of both the genders male and female and when there are people who have certain DSD disorder, as they call it, they have high testosterone level, which World Athletics believes gives them advantage over other athletes. But this advantage, in opinion of World Athlete, exists only when that athlete participates in women events. That means, in short, only when that athlete is a woman. So there is a requirement you can still participate you may in athletic events you may have dsd disorder as they call it but you may still participate however there are three conditions that you have to satisfy that you agree to bring your testosterone levels down less than 5 nml to per liter and you agree second condition is you agree to keep them at reduced level for a period of six months before actual competition third condition is you have to have you need to have a legal certificate in your hand which identifies you as a woman or as an intersex so you can declare to the world i am intersex i have more testosterone level but i am agreeing to go through certain medical procedures and i'll bring down that level and i'll keep that level down for six month period before the competition and during the competition also and then they will allow you to participate. Castor Semenya said, I will participate the way I was born. I will not do anything to my body. I have a right. I have, was born certain way. I am not going to change that. Now, when this case went to Cass, a lot of witnesses were examined. In fact, Duthi Chand also gave a testimony and she explained in detail that how 
what kind of horrible experience it was for her when this news broke out in media and you know india is is legendary when it comes to media trial when it comes to leveling allegations against any person and when it comes to breaking self confidence of a person by declaring that person guilty of something despite the fact that that case has not gone to courts people have courts or judges or caste judges have not applied their minds to that particular subject but people declare that person as guilty and they call names so duty chand explained in greater detail that what was it was a horrific experience for her to be to be you know it was alleged that she is a man and she just dresses as a woman and then she also declared in later years that she is in a in a same sex relationship with another woman then also questions were raised however that's a separate story so when this matter reached cas cas found that dsd regulations are discriminatory uh, but these regulations are necessary these are reasonable and these are proportionate if you want to achieve the integrity of female athletics i don't know what do they mean by integrity of female athletics as if dsd people or intersex people are destroying the sanctity of being a woman so they said it is necessary but these regulations are discriminatory so caste seminal's case was dismissed that is very unfortunate but here i want to point out the spirit of this lady that is why i mentioned this court right in the beginning before telling you the case of caste seminal that this has actually made me stronger decision of caste will not hold me back see these words what kind of a person caste seminal is really strong really spirited in 2019 she said in 2019 she said that i'll move to football and she did try her hand at football and in 2020 she said okay do not allow me to run 400 meter 800 meter and 1500 meter runs but i shall continue running in your face and i shall run all the events less than 400 meters and the uh, tokyo olympics have been uh, postponed and she also she will have to qualify for that event but the spirit is she is not ready to accept whatever you are giving to her the injustice that she is met with she is not ready to accept that she has taken that in her stride and is ready to bounce back similar to duti chand after that caste decision she won it luckily with the help of all the legal help that was extended to her uh, pro bono by a canada based law firm she announced to the world it is a big thing for a girl from a village a small village she announced to the world that she is in same sex relationship and she is continuing continues to live with her partner her own family her own sister created a lot of problems for her when she announced this when she came out so this is the kind of spirit that these women have they've struggled throughout their lives shafali verma posed as a man to just to play just to do what she loves doing duti chand and caste simenia after winning after creating history uh, duti chand has had a series of national uh, championship Uh, records and similarly caste seminia she wins almost everything whenever she appears so these are women of really strong character they will not bow down we'll have to change so here i want to see three names on your screen and these are very important names catherine switzer jock semple and thomas miller it's a small incident i'm sure some of you know about this this is the picture of that event that i'm talking about this girl with bib 261 is kathleen switzer she tried to participate she was the first woman who participated in boston marathon at that time when she participated in 1960s it was across societies it was believed that women are not made to run marathon and they should not be allowed and they were not allowed to participate in marathons but this woman kathleen switzer she used to sign her name as kv switzer she entered posing as man again and she was allowed to participate 
because people thought that she's a man but when she appeared there people could see that she's a she and not a he and then a person called jock sample whose name appears here second he was a uh, one of the officials of the boston marathon he tried to push her out of the marathon she he did not want her to participate but this gentleman this bulky gentleman with bib bib number 390 called thomas miller pushed jock sample out of the out of the path and made sure that this girl kathleen switzer continued her marathon journey remaining marathon so here i would just request there are people like jock sample and there are people like thomas miller also world will be easy for all the kathleen switzers if we behave like thomas miller and not like jock sample so that's the end of my presentation for you and i will leave you with that picture that's a beautiful picture a woman kathleen switzer trying to do against all odds and few people stopping her preventing her but a certain support also exists and that is true for everyone all the women in sports also true that there are women who are doing things which are which do not fall within the category strict compartments that we want our women to be in but still we are doing it lot of women are doing it when i say we i mean women in general and people oppose women but support is also there and people who oppose don't be jock sample of catherine switzer please be thomas miller that's the end and i would uh, be happy to discuss this with all of you if you want to discuss thank you so much ma'am for your enlightening presentation uh, i expect some questions from you guys if there are any questions uh, you may you may share with all of us thank you even if you do not have any questions if you have something to share the women and the men also who are here if they would like to share some of the stories from their lives or sports probably okay while we get uh, questions let me just tell you that uh, just an idea here that can we curb this can we prevent gender discrimination in sports by uh, devising and implementing a law against this can we do that just a thought food for thought if anyone of you would like to express your opinion on this or would like to think more on this when you go back home interestingly we have something called national sports development code in our country which uh, which uh, which is passed by ministry of sports and which has all the rules primarily on all the subjects relating to sports federations it also talks about harassment of women uh because they are women uh, so you cannot harass if you are a national sports federation it is your responsibility to sport, uh, stop harassment of women because they are women but this national sports development code 2011 also does not talk about anything on gender issues okay um, there is one question which is coming from avide uh she is asking she is saying thank you kanishka for bring a very unique perspective of looking at gender when it comes to the payment of grading or grading to the players in india i think it is much beyond the gender difference how it is to do with intersectionality of gender caste race and much more uh, she has taken a, taken up a very broad view uh, can you can you please uh, uh <clears throat> caste race and much more i'm not sure uh, i am actually not sure if players are categorized by sports federation in the pay brackets based on their caste or race that can very well happen in india yes we've seen that there is lot of racism in india and sports persons also face that face that uh, you know 
uh, bear the br brunt of being from a certain region or probably belonging to a certain race, certain ethnicity or certain caste. That could be true. However, right now when I think about it, that may be true. But just compare the numbers that I gave you. Despite all the race and caste and other issues on which the payment depends for a sports person, there is a stark difference between Harman Preet Kaur's experience and Washington Sundar, right? So that is true that a certain player may be put in a bracket because he belongs to a certain caste, belong because he belongs to a certain region also. But generally, when you compare women and men, all these uh, you know uh, issues, all these categories of caste, race and regionalism these just blur get blurred completely get blurred down and only thing that it comes to for is either you are a man or a woman and there is a stark difference just because you are a woman and a man that is true that every issue is not that simple as it looks out to be but here because we were discussing specific issues gender issues and gender issues as we see as we've seen from our experience and as we understand those gender issues those have existed primarily and uh, because of bias of our society against women so but but that's a very good point that you've made i hope you i pronounce your name rightly abhiboy that's a very good point but here we were restricting ourselves to discussion with respect to gender issues only that is why i tried to highlight that dis difference Okay, thank you for your answer. Uh, now I have a question <clears throat> for you. Uh, I have made uh, certain observations. Uh, actually, I, am, I was also a sports person. I was into boxing. And uh, so I have seen the world inside the ring as well as outside the ring. So on my experiences, uh, I just want to share something with you all. Let's see, uh, female athletes, as we know, they are involved in an eternal fight for uh, their rights a fight that makes several of them go as far as to give up on their dreams. You know, we have, uh, you have taken uh, some examples, okay, right, from the teacher and then gastro seminar, so and so forth. Then the problems are countless. So women are objectified by fans, uh, then commentators and even coaches, because people look at women's sports as a showcase for their pleasure. Uh, female athletes have to deal with sexist comments coming especially from men who think these female athletes are not strong or talented enough to perform well. So basically, this entire gender issue is not only limited to, you know, the discrimination in case of pay packets, but there are other angles also. Rather, uh, the, the main psyche uh, is reflected. It, it's, uh, it, it, it's coming out very openly, right? when uh, this gender issue is coming up. So how do you look at uh, this gender issue from completely uh, broader perspective, from the perspective of the spectators, from the perspective of fellow sportsmen? I'm talking about sportsmen. How sportsmen, you know, look at this issue, which a women's sports uh, person, you know, they are facing. How would you see that? Well, that's a very good point that you've raised, Dr. Baba. Uh, that's true. Everybody, whether it's spectators or the support staff or the general officials related to that particular sport, everybody has a certain kind of bias towards a particular gender. And when you mentioned objectification of women, who can forget cases of Maria Sharapova and Sanya Mirza? Sanya Mirza, as we all know, there have been some fatwas by her community clerics against her for wearing certain kind of clothes on court. And despite knowing that every woman player has to wear, and that is very comfortable when you're playing, if you sport that kind of sports uniform. So we've seen that there has been objectification of women by from all quarters. And when you mentioned that, how do sports men see sports women? Here, something really interesting happened in Australia, that in Australian cricket, the difference between prize money of women and men were very uh, huge. But Australian men, the Australian cricket uh, men's team supported women throughout in their fight for getting equal prize money. 
and that is what uh, how sportsmen also see if you have opposition you also have support just like life you know uh, we we meet men as women we meet men who are just horrible <laughs> but at the same time we met meet men who are quite supportive so that's how i see it that yes women have uh, are being objectified they have a lot of uh, they have to face a lot of issues from all the quarters spectators and support staff and sports fellow players also but there is support also at the same time and that is the main point the mentality of a society has to change and when that changes everything else will fall in place hmm that's that's correct i mean it's uh, at the end everything reduces at the level of psychology mentality your cultural upbringing social upbringing and how open you are to the change thank you thank you so much uh, i have one more question it's about the uh, you have spoken about gender verification test i just want to understand the constitutional aspects involved in that so as a as a practicing advocate what is your take on it absolutely very good point that it's a direct invasion of my privacy because and also if you would see it is also discrimination under article 14 isn't it because if you will see i am sure there are men who have higher testosterone level than normal men usually has so if just for example and this is a hypothetical example if men in general have testosterone levels of let's say 20 nml per liter then i'm sure there are men who have 30 testosterone natural level naturally occurring testosterone in their body you do not ask those men to appear for sex verification test or for any kind of test for that matter to prove that it does not give them competitive advantage but for a particular gender you have this test so this is certainly you are being discriminated because of being belonging to a certain gender so this is discrimination based on gender clear clearly in my understanding i may be wrong i may be missing out some Uh, points about this some aspects but in my understanding it is not unconstitutional to subject a woman to appear for a certain kind of medical procedure medical tests because you are of a specific gender how does law define woman law actually does not define a woman to be honest but the this this definition this moral definition this has been evolved by the definitions that sporting authorities in the world have accepted or have you know laid down in their rule books just to give you a background here right right that law uh, bod- uh, sorry sporting bodies these are not law making bodies they are neither authorized nor capable of legislating any law but world over sport is seen to be an autonomous sector and that is why sporting bodies are allowed to have their own rules own set of norms for everything every area concerning sport so it is not actually law per se whatever we are discussing but it is the norms of certain private bodies which are applicable on sports person so if you are a sports person you have to abide by rules of these private bodies and in india there have been certain uh, number of legislations in which the authorities of these bodies has been questioned and it has been asked and the questions have been raised that these bodies are of such structure now that they should be deemed to be government state and not just private bodies and not just in india there have been number of legislations elsewhere also and there have been legis- uh, cases sorry and in fact some countries have passed legislation to that effect that these bodies are not private anymore they have an uh, auto- they are autonomous but they are not private and they shall be akin to being a state okay thank you thank you so much uh, is there any other question any anybody you would like to share something 
uh, as a uh, advocate tyagi rightly mentioned that if you have any experience to share or maybe any concern or maybe if you want to share some ideas that how to tackle these problems at social level at legal level your views are welcome and this is an open stage as usual whenever there are less questions dr babar at the end of a session that i conduct i assume that i was very good <laughs> well <Where>, indeed <laughs> <laughs> no doubt no doubt about that but well, indeed i i really wish you know, we could have some more time in hand um, and uh, continue uh, well i have one question yeah please, please go ahead. hello yeah i have one question uh, uh, just a few years back at least a few years and i'm not sure that it's few years or a uh, long time back uh, there was a case about where the sanya mesa received an award way and on the other side yeah, yeah. sanan anwar had uh, protested regarding why she has been given the award so how would the sports federation deal in such kind of situation when it comes to giving awards to a specific person okay so basically it's like any other organization it entirely depends on your performances and can can you hear me So it's like any other organization. Yeah, yes, yes, okay. again. It's like any other organization. Awards, rewards, all these are given on the basis of your performance. And obviously, whenever these awards are given at any level, whether in films or by government of India, in sport, in movies, for uh, general contribution to maybe sciences or anything. obviously there are quarters who feel that no this award should have gone to x person and there are quarters who believe the award should have gone to y person in such a situation uh, if award has been conferred by the national sports federation the primary sports federation which governs and regulates the sport in our country and which has been conferred with the status of being nsf then that is a dispute situation that dispute can be raised before the arbitration commission of that federation provided if such a situation has been deemed to be a dispute under the constitution under the bylaws of that particular sports federation so how this dispute will be resolved and whether it can be resolved by the arbitration commission in the first place and then the international federation and then the cas that entirely depends on the bylaws of that particular sports federation however in my understanding whenever awards are conferred they are not directly conferred by sporting federations but private bodies sometimes yes sporting bodies also confer and there is a criteria which is made public before conferring those awards for instance some if you take example of a sport like mountain climbing mountain climbing not just award you are not allowed to participate you are allowed to participate in international event only if you are in five of of that year and that top performance that top ranking there is a full fledged written criteria based on which you are ranked and that ranking system is made public every sports person is aware of that criteria so i'm not sure about this particular controversy between mirza and nehwal but if there existed a criteria which was made public and based on that the awards was conferred then the the dispo- dispute could have been resolved and these two individuals they belong to different sports then i am assuming that this award was not given by any sporting federation but either a private body or state government or central government so it the award dispute will be decided the way any other dispute is de- decided however i am sure it was just a controversy and usually sports person or any person for that matter whenever they are unhappy or upset about not being awarded not being recognized they do not take it they do not turn it into a legal dispute they just uh, express their 
uh, unhappiness over social media okay thank you uh, thank you for your elaborate uh, answer uh, if there is no more question let me ask one more question to you and that is uh, let us uh, try to visualize uh, what kind of legal solution we can give to this particular problem now see when it comes to uh, sports like boxing we know that there is international boxing federation that we have uh, indian boxing federation so whatever the rules and regulation which is being framed by international boxing federation in terms of selection criteria in terms of maybe weight criteria categories so on and so forth required to be followed by indian boxing federation as well so when it comes to the change right so i think that should uh, that should come uh, at the at the international level okay so i just want to know is there any movement like that which is going on in any part of the world regarding uh, regarding uh, protection of the rights of the women in the sports or maybe a gender movement going on in the context of sports so that uh, which could uh, act as a uh, as a some sort of pressure okay upon those international bodies uh, you know in respect to different different sports so they could change their regulations and then they, they could make it more female friendly rather than discriminatory so are you aware of any social movement any gender justice movements going on in the context of sports well there are many movements which which exist in different parts of the world and different sports also and when we discussed duti chand case it was a huge campaign in fact she was represented without spending any money at cas which is a very expensive affair firstly it is outside country secondly there is a huge fee that you have to pay at cas and thirdly obviously council fee is also uh, fees are also very high but she was represented without being charged anything and that was a huge campaign and similar to that we've recently seen rowing uh, a campaign by rowing team of us and then ice hockey so there have been campaigns time and again and you said that what could be the solution in legal terms if you want to change in india when we discuss law that how can we change the system of the state of sports if you want to change it through the tools of law then in india the problem lies between state subject and concurrent subject sports finds mention in the state subject state list but uh, central government uh, parliament legislates on it because of entry 10 and 13 in uh, in in central list they that these 10 and 13 do not directly empower parliament to legislate on sport but these entries empower to legislate on conferences international relations so under these two categories parliament wishes to legislate a mammoth parent sports legislation which shall which should be applicable across the country across the sports on every sports person but parliament so far has not been successful in doing that because states keep creating that noise that no sports is a state subject we should be empowered to legislate on it so there has been voices raised in the past by the central governments different central governments that sport should be taken from state list to concurrent list which will uh, entitle parliament also to legislate on uh, sports also so that is a big problem and everything like most of the issues become political issues at some level or the other this issue has also borne the burnt of being a political and of having a political angle so this has been milled in past also different sports ministers comes and this has been part of their manifesto also of some parties that we will do something for we will have a parent sports legislation there was a sports bill also recently which was a very comprehensive obviously there were some loopholes and anomalies in that but those attempts have failed because of this issue that sports is actually and essentially a state subject wonderful there is one more question coming from avibe she is asking as mentioned in your presentation gender and sex cannot be used interchangeably and i observe that you seems to have overlook on the transgender issue mm-hmm. 
Would yes, you make a I, I have did not overlook. I did not include it because uh, <clears throat> yes, there are people who are transgender in sports. For them, if they are only transgender, gen transgender means you do not identify as the biological sex that is being assigned to you by birth. So, if you are a man, you do not identify as a man. You identify as a woman, then you are a transgender, and you participate in a male category. Then nobody can stop you. But if you undergo corrective surgery and you acquire opposite sex, then your acquired gender becomes your real gender. In that situation, there exists a regulation to that effect. Uh, if in most of the federations, in that situation. If you have gone through, uh, undergone a surgery, corrective surgery, then you have to have, uh, you need to have a legal certificate which identifies you as that, as your acquired gender, and then you can participate in your acquired gender category. So I did not, I did not talk much about it because. it allows uh, sporting bodies allows transgenders to participate and there have been examples in history and in recent past of transgender people participating in sports in their chosen category if they identified as female despite being male and they un underwent surgery and they acquired another gender they participated in their acquired gender category and there have been transgenders who did not undergo any surgery but they continued participating in the category of their biological gender so that is why i did not talk about it we i believe i believe that transgenders have a way either way whichever way they choose to be represented in to play sports of their choice in their cate cho chosen category so that is why i did not discuss it aviva but some very good questions from aviva i hope i am pronouncing the name right thank you thank you so much oh yeah it is aviva okay great uh, any other question uh, if there are no more question then shall we go ahead and uh, conclude the program okay uh, advocate kanishka tyagi thank you so much for your time and uh, i still remember our first telephonic conversation when i requested you and how enthusiastic you were you know and uh, that was something uh, very amazing which i found in your personality you know, your hard working nature and you are uh, you are very social minded and uh, this is something which i uh, identify with the personality of uh, uh, an ideal sort of lawyer so you are not just a lawyer or advocate but rather you are people's representative so thank you so much uh, for coming and uh, giving us your valuable insights about the subject which is actually very controversial very simple but yet very complex to comprehend if the mind is still infected with prejudices Dear friends, thank you so much for joining, and uh, my special gratitude to Aviva. Thank you so much. As usual, uh, today also you have asked wonderful question. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kanishka. Thank you, Krishnan. Thank you, all of you. See you again next week.